Welcome to Wild Ideas Worth Living, a show where we talk to experts who've taken a wild idea and made it a reality so you can too. From people who have sailed around the world to those who've started thriving businesses and even broken records, some of the wildest ideas can lead to the most rewarding adventures. I'm your host, Shelby Stanger, and I hope you enjoy this show. This is episode 37 with pro snowboarder, filmmaker, and outdoor activist, Zeppelin Zerip. This episode was brought to you by Keen. On all my greatest wild adventures, I've had a pair of Keens with me. I wore them when I stand up paddle down a portion of the Peruvian Amazon River, when I went tubing through the glowworm caves in New Zealand, and even trekking through the rainforest of Costa Rica. Keen's most known for their Newport sandal. They're made to go in water and on land, but right now they also have some amazing new styles I'm especially excited about. The Terradora collection, for example, was designed specifically for the unique biomechanics of a woman's foot and stride. It was designed so you could trek all through Yosemite or any great hiking destination, and so you could wear them through the city streets, on the beach, and they're stylish enough to wear out after with leggings or jeans. Best of all, Keen is a family-owned company. They're out of Portland, Oregon. They're committed to not only protect the places we play outside, but they also provide numerous grants to causes and difference makers who share their ambitious goals. They support some kick-ass ambassadors as well. You can check them out at keenfootwear.com. That's K-E-E-N footwear.com for more. Zeppelin Zerip arguably has one of the coolest names of anyone I've interviewed. He's a pro snowboarder from Sparta, Michigan, an active outdoor advocate. He's the author of the book, Don't Call Me a Gypsy, which is about his road trip, and it's an adventure memoir of his life story. He's a producer and partner of Wizard Media. That's W-Z-R-D Media. It stands for We Zeroed In on the Reality of Our Dreams. He's the co-founder of a grassroots snowboard competition called Occupy Pando, He studied international business at Westminster College, is an ambassador for Keen Footwear. He's now working on an important documentary that explores the left and the right side of how we look at the great public land debate. And he's just an interesting guy. We talk about all of these things. He also shares a little bit about his past. We go deep first, then we go a little bit lighter. I hope you enjoy this show. Zeppelin Zerip is an interesting guy. Today we have Zeppelin Zerip, the coolest name for a podcast guest ever. Zeppelin, welcome to the show. <laughs> How you doing? So we should just start with your name because people are like picturing this guy in tie-dye, I'm sure. And that's not you. I was picturing that until I met you this weekend. <laughs> yeah, that is not me. And I appreciate you not asking like Led. It's got to be the oldest joke joke in the book when people meet me. So I appreciate that. Um, but yeah, not tied at all. My mom um, is actually a school principal and my dad was a contractor and just a voracious reader. And uh, yeah, neither were hippies. I don't think my mom has ever smoked pot in her entire life. So pretty straight edge parent. But the name, you were named after a famous, is it pilot? Uh, so I was named after Ferdinand Graf Zeppelin and he was this German aristocrat, uh, and inventor and military captain. And he first saw a, you know, a flying airship essentially in Minnesota and brought that idea and that dream back home to Germany. And his story is just remarkable because no one believed in him for the longest time until he finally had some, you know, some of these Zeppelins that could actually fly. And Eventually, it became the pride of Germany. He rallied the support of the entire country behind him. And the Zeppelin was the largest airship to ever fly. The largest one, I think, was over 800 feet long. And collectively, they flew a million miles. They did the first crossing over the North Pole. They crossed the Atlantic. They're these remarkable airships. So, And unfortunately, they uh, had a bad rap after the infamous Hindenburg explosion in New Jersey and are no longer uh, flying today. So what's up with the fly high, go far? Yeah. Fly high, go far. is just kind of this family motto that you know, my mom bestowed upon me probably when I was four years old. I was 
super energetic young kid, just always sprinting. And, uh, you know, that's just been the family motto we've kind of, you know, adopted early on, but even more so through my teenage years. And as we encountered a lot of adversity as a family, it's just like, all right, we got this and we're just going to keep moving forward. That was, you know, just forward motion because we, we went through a lot in those years. Yeah. So Zep, I watched this documentary on you fly high, go far. I thought that was an awesome movie. First off, you're a pro snowboarder. So maybe you just tell me really quickly what snowboarding does for you and how you got into it and your relationship with it today. I got into snowboarding just through my mom and dad when I was six. They got me a snowboard for Christmas um, and began at this small, small resort called Pando in western Michigan where I grew up. And Pando was only a 100-foot vertical hill with six tow ropes and not much of a terrain park to speak of at all. But today, snowboarding, I mean, it's that is a tough question to answer. What does snowboarding mean to me today? Snowboarding is everything. It's this, you know, it's my earliest passion and still my passion. It's the moment when I feel the most joy in my entire life. It's my community. It's dictated where I live, where I've gone to school, who I associate with. Snowboarding has really shaped and defined my life up until this point, I think. And that's changing now, but Still, I ride four or five days a week in the winter, and yeah, my love, my love for snowboarding is it's hard to put into words, as I think most snowboarders would say. So, so question for you, you know, I've I've saw that you went to Crested Butte Academy, which was a snowboard school. You competed in slope style. So, for people just who don't know you, maybe you can just tell us a little bit about your competitive okay. snowboard career. Yeah, so when I was young, I was really fortunate to receive a scholarship to go to Crested Butte Academy, which was a snowboard boarding school where we would do school half day and snowboard the other half day. And then on the weekends, we would travel around to compete. And I did that through middle and high school and then continued competing after in events like the U.S. Open, the Grand Prix slope style events, um, things of that nature until I broke my femur when I was 19. And that really shuttered any dreams of competing professionally in snowboarding. Um, when I broke my femur, I was training at Keystone and that completely took me out of snowboarding for almost two years. I actually moved to Miami and began working on a private yacht and just completely changed my life. Um, you know, moved to the oceans over the mountains and took a different direction because I knew if I stayed in the mountains without being able to snowboard, I would be a very uh, unhappy person. <laughs> so removed myself from that temptation and yeah, worked on a luxury private yacht. That's in cool. South Beach, Miami. I so, actually lived on a yeah. yacht and it was a really, int- I actually lived on a 127 foot sailboat. It was beautiful. Okay. Where? It was in Mission Bay. It was only for a month or two, but it was so fun. And and you learn a lot about, I don't know, living on a sailboat is, is pretty incredible. I want to ask you about that. But really, I want to talk to you about loss because I watched this quick movie on you, Fly High, Go Far. And at a young age, you experienced the loss of your dad. I lost my dad at age 11. It sounds like you lost your dad at 12 or 14. Uh, yeah, 15. 15. That's a pretty pretty pivotal time to lose your dad. Your house was burned down and you broke your femur. Can you tell me just a little bit about, these are pretty pivotal things that can happen to someone, especially a young man. What did you learn from loss in each of these experiences? I, so I think that the first major thing was my dad passing away and he passed away from alcohol poisoning when I was 15. I was in the middle of high school and my grandpa came to the school and he was the one who broke the news to me. And that, that had been a, a tumultuous relationship for a number of years because of his drinking. My parents had divorced before that and it was two years later that he passed away from, you know, from alcohol poisoning. And it was difficult to live with him 
and it was difficult to live without him. There was no easy part of it of living with an alcoholic and it's hard to it's hard to understand and to empathize with someone who has an alcoholic parent or alcoholism in their family if you don't just the the roller coaster that that person can put you through so when he passed away it was you know in some ways it was easier because we didn't have to deal with the late night calls just the all of the things that come with living with someone who's battling this disease and it is a disease and that's you know initially that loss left me with a lot of anger I was you know a very angry teenage kid and as I've grown older and spent more time reflecting on that I've I've learned a lot that you know this was not of his own making and this was not his decision to you know tear apart our family and put us through that but it truly is this disease that he battled against and unfortunately lost that battle but it's made me very aware of my own drinking and aware of, you know, the the effects of addiction on an individual. And it's created a higher degree of empathy within me. I think that's one of the largest things I've taken away from this is being able to slow down, listen to people's stories and understand what they're going through as opposed to just blowing through them and saying, oh, you're you're responsible for all these scenarios you found yourself in. And that's not always true because I, I watched it within my own family. And then, as you mentioned, quickly following that was our family home burning down. And we, I always joke about that it was my sister's fault because she had been pushing hot coals down the flue the evening before, um, regardless of whether that's what happened or not. The next day, our house burned down. And we were <laughs> without a home when I was 19 and my sister was 15. And that, I think because we had already been through so much with my dad passing away, that kind of just happened and we accepted it. And my mom began joking that at least she didn't have cancer because, you know, everything else had kind of gone to hell, but at least she was still around to uh, help us all and be this, this rock in the family. And she truly was. My mom is the strongest woman I know, you know, and being able to support us all the time. Um, but yeah, that, that was a huge loss and we rebuilt that home, but, and it, it, I guess, sorry, I'm a little convoluted there, but that was almost just some benefit. A lot of those memories of my father were in that house and we were able to start anew with a fresh slate and a fresh home to rebuild that life in. So that was, a. Uh, almost a blessing in disguise. Well, well, Zep, thank you for sharing that. I, I know those are pretty heavy moments. So alcoholism ran in my family as well. Grandpa, an alcoholic, grandma, alcoholic. My mom works in drug and alcohol prevention now. So I grew up kind of going to alcohol, alcoholics, not anonymous, but like Alateen, which is for like teens with alcoholics in their family. And, and my dad died when I was young. And we have a lot of similarities. And I think your story helps a lot of people. But what I thought was so interesting was when I met you, you're so passionate, so positive, And you've chosen to not let these things that have happened to you kind of get you down. But it's almost like in a way that these things that have happened to you have just catapulted you. What You're only 25. Is that right? Yeah, 25. So you're only 25 and it sounds like you've done a lot. So thank you for sharing this. I, th- I think your story is going to help a lot of people. I think alcoholism runs in a lot of families and you can't empathize unless you've been through it. The wildest part of it is, is when you show yourself in your vulnerabilities, other people are so much more open to show theirs. And that's been one of the largest things that film you mentioned, fly high, go far. And the book I wrote this fall, you know, people have watched that and read that and come to me and said, you know, wow, I've just gone to 30 AA meetings in 30 days. And I can't tell you how much that meant to me to see someone else's experience. One woman told me that her great granddaughter was stillborn and I couldn't even see the connection until I recognized that she just wanted someone to talk to and recognize that I could be that person because I wasn't going to judge her because I had so put myself out there and created opportunities to be judged by others. And people just came out of the woodwork with their own stories. And that was remarkable. And it, I think that was the most profound impact of that film was other people feeling comfortable sharing their own stories with me and being able to resonate with them on that level. 
So how did you get into film? Because right now I met you at, at Outdoor Retailer and I got to go to your, your film trailer premiere, a movie about the debate on public land. And I really want to get into that. But first, I want to understand, like, how did you get into film? Because that's a career that's not easy and and it's it's an interesting career path. Yeah. So I took a really unique approach to film and a lot of the credit is to my two business partners, Phil Hessler and Galen Knowles, who had the idea to make a documentary when we were all in school at Westminster College here in Salt Lake. And Phil's adopted brother actually is from Uganda and is trying to be the first African to snowboard in the Winter Olympics. And we awesome. began that as a student project and had this team of nine or 10 people all working on it for three years. Um, and when that premiered, it was picked up by Red Bull TV and debuted on their streaming platform. So that was a huge break for us. You know, our first piece of work that we did resulted in a feature length documentary on Red Bull and sort of catapulted us as we all graduated to start this new business, Wizard Media. And we'd been doing smaller projects for REI, Vice, things of that nature when this public lands debate really flared up in Utah and came onto our radar through things like Bears Ears, um, Terry Tempest, um, the incident out in Oregon on the Malheur Wildlife Refuge, and got me just doing deeper research. What is going on in our backyard? And I recognized it was part of this really age-old debate about federal ownership of these public lands in the Western states. So back up for, for people who don't know what sorry. the public land. No, this is great. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but but for people who don't know what the public land debate is, just can you give us a quick brief overview of what it is? Because in Salt Lake City, it's really magnified. It's not as magnified right now in San Diego where I'm living. Yeah. So the public land debate stems from the federal government managing or owning 40 percent of the land in these western states. So the Western states think Colorado westward. And there's a lot of resentment built up in these rural communities because they feel like they're being managed by the federal government and there's federal overreach and that their individual rights are being restricted. So there's this constant tension and it's been flaring since the early 19th century between these rural communities that are dependent on extractive industries versus these urban communities that are more prone to conservation and more aware of the environment on a global scale. And we're seeing this really flare up right now because of a number of things. One, the new Trump administration coming in and this monument review that he has enacted and that his secretary of the interior, Ryan Sinke, is carrying out. And then this transfer idea from federal management to state management of all public lands. And that was more of an issue last summer and had much more momentum as a movement. And that's sort of dwindled in the past year, but it's not a new idea. It's been brought up in a variety of forms and names since the 40s. Um, and we're just seeing the latest iteration of it now. And so this film is our response to that public lands debate. And you know, our belief is that these public lands truly are public. They're yours, they're mine, they're your neighbors, and that we all have a vested interest and ownership in them as Americans, and we want to keep it that way. So by transferring them or selling them off, you know, that is the absolute last thing that we want to do. Um, so we brought this idea to Keen, and they were completely on board, supported our vision for the film, and have partnered with us to make this, this two-year project all about public lands conservation throughout the country. So it's it's an unbiased film in the sense that you're interviewing people on the left and the right. Yeah, we're trying to take as much of an unbiased approach as possible by interviewing people that work within these industries we're profiling. So logging, ranching, energy development, you know, we're spending time and living with these families to show respect to their stories because you know, this could very easily be seen as another environmental documentary. And that's what we want to avoid. We want to paint a portrait of what it looks like to be 
a public lands rancher in southern Utah and what it looks like to be a logger in Roseburg, Oregon, where you're down to a four day school week and you have no sheriff between 12 p.m. and 8 a.m. because there's no more funding from the logging industry collapsing and to showcase these rural communities and understand their grievances and bring them into this conversation that we're having around conservation say how can we work together because if we make another environmental documentary we know our audience it's the left it's people that already agree with us but if we can open this up and say you know let's promote this conversation and prompt a dialogue between the right and the left quote unquote and see if we can move forward with the same goals as this cohesive group because there really is not that much dividing us when you get down to the dirt and talk to these people. They're frustrated that the way things have panned out, but they're not unwilling to have conversations and try and find a common ground on these issues. And that's what I think we're uniquely suited to do. You know, I drive a diesel F-250 so we can pull up to these people and they're like, oh, you know, you, you belong out here. And they've opened their doors to us. We're leaving to Southern Utah tomorrow to go herd cattle in LaSalle for five days. And that's an amazing opportunity to have. So tell me about some of these characters in the movie. When, when I saw the trailer, you know, there was this, you talked about this overweight woman with a mullet who had a bunch of guns and some Native Americans and maybe just paint us a yeah. picture of, of a few of these characters that you're really excited about. Yeah, so the, the characters I'm most excited about are the characters that we're doing deep dives with, living with. And the first one is Sarita Riviera. She's a woman in Roseburg, Oregon, who is the most compassionate woman I've ever met. They've, they were Her husband and her were married when she was 15. They became the youngest couple in Oregon history to apply for adoption. And they've since fostered over 50 kids through their house. Um, But in every other way, you would think you couldn't relate to them. You know, they are climate change skeptics. They're Trump supporters. But these people have the biggest hearts ever. And we lived with them for three weeks at their ranch in Oregon. And just were able to paint this portrait of what their day to day is like. These foster kids coming and going, the relationships that they develop with them as they grow up, graduate high school, go on to careers, you know, as they go out and log on a daily basis with Manuel's son and Sarita's son. And then tomorrow we go to Southern Utah and we're going to live with this family, the Reds. And the father is, you know, grooming his daughter to pass off the the ranch. They're public lands ranchers. They graze over 270,000 acres south of Moab and but they work with the Nature Conservancy and these nonprofit environmental groups to say what is a proper range management plan look like and how can we do this so he's his daughter is only 19 you know she's this cute 19 year old girl and she's just not the face that you would typically associate with a rancher so we want to follow her as she begins you know having these meetings with the brew of land management as she's prepped for this role that she'll fulfill later in her life. And then following that, my partner Galen and I will go to Alaska and live with the Gwich'in Native Americans up there and experience their day-to-day life and how dependent they are on the caribou and in Kaktovik all the way up into the Arctic, how dependent they are on whaling and to paint this portrait of these Native communities that are also living on the border of large-scale oil and natural gas development and what that relationship looks like. So we'll leave to do that later this month. And that may be the trip that I'm most excited for. We're going to spend a month in Alaska and it's going to be, it's going to be chilly, but uh, it's going to be wild. You're not going to be camping, are you? Oh, we actually are for two of the four weeks. You are. Didn't you say (laughs) that you had to be wary of some like white bears? Polar yeah, bears? so some polar bears in Kaktovik, they they come on shore now because global warming has the icebergs retreating so far. But I guess I won't say we're technically camping. It's a uninsulated 
plywood shack with some twin mattresses thrown in it that will be staying in there. So we'll fully be in mummy bags and uh, freezing our tails off. And then in Arctic Village, we'll fully be camping. So, yeah, not glamorous, the making of this film. We've been sleeping in cow pastures and just the woods and our cars. I didn't even have an apartment for four months because I was just living out of my truck on the road uh, making this so the goal through this film is to really showcase that the right and left aren't that different and that public lands need to be preserved for the public. Is that correct? Or Yeah, that's about as well as I could sum up this thesis, you know, to, to find some common understanding about this issue that I think is one of the largest environmental issues that we're facing in the country right now. If these public lands are opened up to more development or sold off, that is a massive issue for the environment, whether these forests are carbon sinks or releasing all this natural gas and oil, you know, bringing it out of the ground in the Arctic. And one of the largest issues facing our generation right now, and no one seems to be talking about it because it's this abstract idea of public lands. And so to really showcase how public lands are important in the past, present, and future of America and the people that these affect. And that's how we'll be successful, by showcasing the people, creating this degree of empathy with them. How did you find these subjects, these initial subjects? That has been different for every scenario. For Manuel and Sarita Riviera, we were at a essentially what was a 500-person Trump rally, but it was actually a memorial for a man, Lavoie Finicum, who was shot by the FBI unfortunately, in Malheur, leaving the wildlife refuge during this militia standoff. And we were taking some portraits just to showcase the faces and started talking to them and learned their story. And very shortly, two weeks later, we're pulling into their driveway. Um, And then for our Southern Utah family, it was actually my business partner, Galen's old roommate. And we initially were going to go to Montana with a different family. We did a whole scouting trip up there, whirlwind tour to meet all these people, and then pulled the plug on that when he mentioned um, his roommate's story. And then the Alaska stories is just phone calls, spending a lot of time calling people out of the blue, just cold calling them, you know, telling them what we want to do and seeing if they'll let us live with them. And it is remarkable how people are so open to it. They're like, oh yeah, come on up. You know, didn't you Facebook? Second guessing us. Didn't you say Facebook some Native American tribe as well? Oh yeah, I'm Facebook. I'm Instagram, DMing people, everything, Twitter. <laughs> but it works. It works because that's the media that people use to communicate more often than not nowadays. So it's not even that weird to Facebook message someone out of the blue. You know, it's equivalent to emailing them. Um, so yeah. Every every method we can employ to get in touch with these people. We're scrappy. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, you have to be scrappy, especially in this business. And, you're, and, and you know, you're 25, so that's good. You're not jaded yet. Yeah. <laughs> yet. I know. Oh, no, I'm not jaded at all. I'm charging forward with this naive optimism that only a 25-year-old can have. I don't know. I think, I think you're, <laughs> you're old, though, beyond your years. So you've got some wisdom. Zep. I've, I've met you briefly, but I could tell. So... Who who or what inspires you to kind of keep going? You've chosen such a you've had so many wild ideas worth living. You know, from being a pro snowboarder to writing this memoir during a road trip, creating these movies. Where does this inspiration come from? Um I think the deep seated root of it is not failing. You know, I watched my father failed in a number of areas and entrepreneurial endeavors, and that has stuck with me at a very core level. So I just push and push and push and never rest. And that's, I mean, it's exhausting and it's something I'm almost burdened with. But I think my, you know, who inspires me? There's a great Matthew McConaughey quote when he won the Oscars and he was asked who his hero was. And he, he responded, to the old man that asked him that his hero was himself in 10 years. And that stuck with me because it would be easy for me to idolize guys like Jimmy Chin or Jacques Cousteau or Elon Musk, you know, these 
adventurers, these inventors and entrepreneurs, um, that would be an easy inspiration to, to look at or to have as a hero. But I look towards myself in 10 years for inspiration and see who do I want to be? I want to be you know, a Harvard grad that has done these things. And that's what I strive for. I'm really focused on goals. I write down goals for different areas of my life, whether it's creative or physical or business or emotional. And I write them down and look at them every single day. Um, I think that, that's part of what drives me. So do you literally have like a little piece of paper that you take around with you with your goals or do you keep them at your desk? I'm just kind of curious about your rituals and your routines of how you, how you yeah. achieve these. So I have a whiteboard in my room and they're on my computer as well. And I'll like meet up with friends to write them down as well. So we all sort of hold each other accountable by sharing our goals with each other. And I, I mentioned it, but the most important thing for me when doing it is that to divide them. So I've got a number of, you know, athletic pursuits, whether it's peaks I want to climb or climb a grade harder or snowboard a certain line. And then business as well, you know, what we're hoping to do with wizard and impact that this film can have, or whether that's emotional, you know, opening my heart to a new relationship or something, um, and creative designing furniture, writing books and to break it down. So you've got different focuses is, is a huge thing for me. You remind me a lot to kind of go on about no, that. But. It's great. I've got a whiteboard with goals I'm looking at and they're also on a sticky pad, but on my, on my computer, like the sticky notes app. So that's awesome. you have to, you have to have athletic goals, relationship goals. I, I think that's really great. Do you have any other rituals or routines you do every day? Just ways that help make you more sane. I know you push yourself a lot, but you also realize that that doesn't always help you. You know, what, what routines do you have, things that you do every day that, that try and just make you more of a sane, awesome human? I honestly, the only routines and rituals I have are drinking coffee and brushing my teeth. <laughs> like, my life is so up in the air on a day-to-day -day basis that it would be really difficult for me to keep something consistent. The one thing I do is every single day I get outdoors, whether that's to climb, bike, snowboard, run, I have to, or I become like manic. It's just, I don't know, a necessity for me, for my mental health, whether we're on the road or home in Salt Lake, I would say that's my only, you know, ritual and thing I do every single day is push myself physically. So burn off some energy. You know, I have the same, I have a similar problem in that I feel like I was born with extra energy and if it's not used, it becomes destructive. So I also have to surf or run yep. or get out there or just podcast a lot. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you said your dad is a voracious reader. I'm guessing you're a pretty articulate guy. Um, have you read a lot of books and is there one that you gift most often or recommend? Um, to the alchemist is one of my all time favorites. It was one of the four books I pulled from my house when it burned down that the traveler's gift and falling up by Shel Silverstein. So three, sorry. Um, but the alchemist just came to me and seems to come to most people when they're at a transition point in their life. And then the prophet uh, the Prophet was a book that my parents used for their wedding vows, and it's broken down into a number of short essays that deal with every major theme in life, whether that's love, marriage, death, wealth, friendship. And it's told from this prophet who is leaving a community, and as he's leaving and getting on the ship, he bestows all his knowledge to the crowd as they're shouting out and asking him these things. And you can kind of look towards it, you know, to any subject, you know, what is, what is hate and how is hate supposed to be interpreted for us? And you can look and it's there. It's just a three page, simple, simple thing that can offer a ton of guidance in, in times where you may need it. So those are the two books that I keep on my shelf and gift most often. 
And Falling Up by Shel Silverstein. It's so interesting. My mom wrote a book, a memoir, and she called it Falling Up. And I was like, Mom, that sounds really familiar. <laughs> but we also had that book as a Why? kid. And um, it's her book is actually, you know, she talks about alcohol, alcohol, alcoholism in her family growing up. And it's, it's a really good book. But her message is, you know, we fall down a lot, but the goal is to fall up. It's such a great a line. And I've read all those books. Those are all yeah. great books to recommend. You know, I know as a 15-year-old, you you kind of went through a lot and you were probably very energetic, even more so probably as a 15-year-old. What advice, if you could go back, would you give your 15-year-old self? And this is a question I ask everyone because 15 is just a pivotal year for everyone. I would say to my 15 year old self to check my pride. I think it was kind of a defense mechanism with everything I'd been through that I was a pretty cocky kid when I was that young. (laughs) And I think I would have gone a lot further had I been less cocky and, you know, maybe even arrogant. So that that's the advice I would give and to, and to not be angry. Cause I was really angry after my dad passed away and I learned how to, harness that energy and use it. But it was also to my detriment quite often. How did you use it and harness it? It, I just use it as a motivator. Like I've been through so much and, you know, I don't, this is deviating, but I, (laughs) I, when, whenever someone asks me, what, how's my day going? I'm like, you know, best day of my life. And I'm very genuine with that response. And they, you know, often say, okay, that's crazy. Why? I say, well, you're breathing. And it's like, we've, I've been through so much and we've all been through so much that I'm just grateful for every day. And I'm not sure how that relates to that anger that I once had, but I, I was able to learn how to motivate from that and just utilize that energy and put it towards whatever I was working on at the moment. It sounds like you harness the power of gratitude to transform anger. Yeah, I am a very, very grateful person. I recognize that every opportunity I have going in my life right now is not just my own making, but the people I've been fortunate enough to surround myself by. And that's, I am very eternally grateful. Yeah, gratitude is a game changer. I agree. We've lived a wild life, 25 years old. What advice can you give to other people, no matter what they're doing, whether they want to quit their job or get a new job or start a business, climb a mountain, go snowboarding, try a different line, make a movie? How can others live more wildly? That's something I am focused on every single day. And I think the number one thing is who you surround yourself with. So I've got five people that every day I know I'm going to see or talk to. It's my two business partners, Phil and Galen, my mom, my sister, and my roommate. And those are all people that inspire me in different avenues in my life, whether that's pushing physically or pushing on business or my mom and sister and the heart that they just have. I'm very aware of who and what type of energy I bring into my life because that elevates me and inspires me to be better or to do better in a particular way. And yeah, you can say, follow your passion, do this. But if you don't have that support network around you to, you know, to offer guidance and support when you may need it, when you're following your passion, then it's easy to become lost. So I think surround yourself with the best people, the people that inspire you, motivate you, that, you know, will call you on your shit and, make sure that you stick to whatever you say you're going to do. That's, that's the guidance I wish I could offer my, my 15 year old self and anyone else who ever asks All and right. to read more Hunter S Thompson probably. <laughs> well, that's good advice. I don't know about the Hunter S Thompson part. Some people love him. People <laughs> thought he just did a lot of drugs. Zeppelin, how Yeah, can but we- if you want to live a wilder life, <laughs> how can people find out more about you and see this trailer? So we're keeping the trailer under wraps right now because it's just too far out to put out to the public and hold that interest. So we'll be releasing the film in fall of 2018. So just over a year from now, uh, if they want to find out more about me as an individual, they can go to my 
website, zeppelinzerup.com, where that film that you had mentioned earlier, Fly High, Go Far, is, as well as a link to uh, copies of my book that I had written this fall. So mm, I'll have to get that bet. book. Well, Zepp, thank you so much for coming on the show, sharing your wild ideas with me. Yeah. I hope you have an awesome time in Alaska. Yeah. Thank you so much for ha- having me on the show. I'm stoked to uh, be able to share my energy and see what we can do moving forward. Thank you. You. Thank you for listening to the show. Thanks to the folks at Keen Footwear for introducing me to Zeppelin. For more on Zeppelin, check out his website, zeppelinzerip.com. Buy his book. To those listening, thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed the show. We've been getting some great reviews, and we are growing like crazy. So thank you for all the support. If you get a moment, go to iTunes, rate and review the show. This one is from Throwing Stones. He said, Epic, I initially subscribed as a precursor to a month-long Bali trip. Your podcast has helped me maintain my stoke during Lake Atlantic summer flatness. I've been so inspired by you and your guests. I'm beginning to work on my own wild idea. All the thoughts that have run through my head are so similar to what your guests have spoken of, so I guess I'm on the right path so far. With that being said, wherever you are in the world, I hope you're having an awesome day, and don't forget some of the best adventures happen when you follow your own wild ideas. We'll see you next week. We have Todd Glazer, the amazing surf photographer, coming on. Mm -hmm.